Good. If you got your Bibles, and yet we're one of them churches, uh, turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 8. And uh, we're, this is going to be this is going to be good. Now next Sunday, everybody say two two eight, two two eight. All right, that's February twenty eighth. We are we're excited because we're launching our third service. Uh, twenty eight. That's interesting. It, uh, uh, well, two two eight's been showing up on everything for me recently. In fact, when I was growing up, uh, our phone number was two two eight. Um, in fact, our phone number here at the church is 228. Um, the number 28 derives part of its meaning from the fact that it is the product of seven, which is a, a, known as a biblically perfect number. There are 28 writers of the Old Testament. The phrase, the lamb, is used, that is used to refer to Jesus Christ as the lamb that takes away uh, the sins of the world. It's used 28 times in the Bible. Um, and in the book of Acts, uh, it's the longest chapter in the New Testament with 28 chapters. Next Sunday, it's 228, and we are birthing our third service. In fact, what I'd like to ask you to do is for you to pray and ask the Lord to give you a heart for one of the services. Um, it might be the 9 a.m. It might be this one, which is kind of more of the um, experimental service um, that usually finds itself in the recesses of the dark web. And, uh, but this is a fun one, okay? A lot of people, it's, it's their favorite service. Um, uh, also, you, you might have a heart for the 11 a.m. Or you might even have a heart for the 6 p.m. So just kind of pray about, um, Lord, give me a heart for one of these services. Um, if you don't have a heart for any of the services, maybe pray about finding a new church. Um, like, I don't like any of them. I don't even know why I come here. Um, <laughs> it's because they're all closed. I just come here because there's no other. Um, okay, so just pray and ask the Lord uh, uh, to give you a heart for one of the services. And then check in with our team um, because uh, uh, we'd really love to see everybody really plugged in and serving um, in the life of SRC. God's doing some crazy cool stuff here. In fact, this last week we had um, our second uh, deliverance night where, um, where our body, our, our members were the ministers and we got to see a bunch of people uh, receive some really cool healing uh, last Monday night. In fact, we even saw people that they've never been here before and they showed up on Monday night because their friends told them they needed deliverance. Um, <laughs> just kidding. You know, their friends told them, hey, you should, you should go. Um, and they did and it was so wonderful. And I just want to say to all the uh, SRC uh, members here, uh, look, and, and everybody, you know, I, I am so proud of you guys. You guys are just, you guys are going after it, and, and, you're, and you're fearless, and I'm so proud of you. And, and I know that a lot of you are taking on new jobs right now, new responsibilities, new commitments. A lot of you are saying yes for the first time. You've been saying no for decades. I'm so proud of you guys. You guys are just, you're fearless, you're full of courage, you're full of the Holy Spirit, and, and you're alive for such a time as this. And so you just keep rocking on. You just keep going after it, and, and we'll just keep celebrating you and, and serving you. And, um, and know this, that, that, that the best has come. It's not the best is yet to come. We're not waiting for a future glorious day. The best has come. The best is Jesus, and he's inside of you. So let's make today the best day yet. Yeah? Yeah, I don't, I don't want you to be in this place. I don't want you to have this promised land theology of someday, someday, someday I'll be in the land flowing with milk and honey. No, the land flowing with milk and honey, that's Jesus. He is the land. He is inside of you. And when he's inside of you, it, it, it doesn't matter what kind of happenings are occurring in the natural. You have the king of glory inside of you. So you can just say, bring it. The only thing I'm worried about SRC in 2021 is I'm worried that you can get bored. <laughs> so let's just break off all the, 20, all the 2020 trauma, right, so that we can really uh, go after Jesus in 2021. All right, good, that was fun. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and um, today we're going to talk about relationship, and that relationship is greater than being right. And I'll frame this out for you uh, in a second. Uh, some of you, you're, you're new believers, you're new Christians. And I know that just because we've had conversations. Um, others of you, you've been uh, uh, believers for, for a while. Um, and, uh, but for those of you that have been Christians for a while, you can go back to when you first became a Christian and remember how, how tricky it was when you're trying to figure out how to do this thing um, that we call Christianity. Um, in fact, I remember, uh, I remember when I was a kid, um, I was raised in, in, in the church, a child of the 80s, which was a, a tricky time. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I, I had a friend, and he became a Christian. And he was trying to figure out, you know, how to, how, to, how to act like a Christian. He was trying to figure out how to talk like a Christian. 
Only problem is, you know, um, he didn't come from a Christian household. In fact, his dad was a, a fairly famous independent um, gangster rapper in the, in the Seattle area who used words that they don't use uh, really in heaven. And, you know, we'd find ourselves, you know, playing together and, and having fun together. And, and, um, and every now and then he'd get shocked or surprised by something. And he would, and he would drop a word, um, you know, one, one of the words that Jesus probably never said. And the thing is, is that whenever he would, whenever he would swear, he'd always, he'd always, you know, repent. You know, which was, which was awesome. But it meant we had to stop what we were doing so he could have a conversation with Jesus to apologize um, for saying this, this swear word. But, but sometimes I had to let him know, like, bro, the word that you said, you can actually say that word. You know what I'm saying? Because that you didn't necessarily cross, cross the line. So then all of a sudden, we, that didn't make things any better because now all of a sudden we're having this conversation of like, before he has to repent and talk to Jesus, first of all, he'd have to go through me to find out if the word he just said was a swear word or not, right? And sometimes you know, there are words that are um, more gray, you know, and you, you hit on certain words and, 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 you had, and you had to be like, you know, dude, can I, can I, can I say this word? And I'd be like, um... Yeah, okay, that's, you know, <laughs> yeah, that, that's fine. You know, maybe don't, don't make a habit out of it, but like, you know, but yeah, that, that's fine. You don't have to talk to Jesus. Let's just keep playing. And so, um, uh, so the, the, church, the, church gets, the church gets tricky when, when it comes to these, the, to, to these kind of things. And, and for those of you, you know, and, and how do you know that in the church, it's very similar to Facebook. There are those who are right. There are those who think that they are right. And there are those who just don't care. And so this is what we're talking about today, that relationship is greater than being right. You know, and some of you are already, you know, triggered. Not knowing here, the ones watching on Facebook. So anyways, um, you know, this is what, and this will be fun. You know, it, it's the whole thing of, that, how do you know that there, there are 10 commandments, you know, and then there are all the other commandments that we made up to keep demons from entering into people, right? And so you've got like um, just all these unspoken rules, and you can't just tell people to, to go to the word because there are so many things that just are not, you know, in, in the word. Like, now that I'm a Christian, right, is it okay that I'm vegan, right? That's a gray area, okay? Um, and, and, uh, now that I'm a Christian, you know, is it okay that I'm a Democrat, right? You know, now that I'm a Christian, you know, is, is, is it okay that I play the lottery? Now that I'm a Christian, is it okay if I do yoga? Now that I'm a Christian, um, is, is it okay if my husband wears yoga pants? No, that's never okay. And listen, for all the dudes that wear yoga pants, don't leave, stop leaving the house. We were, went, on, went on, on a hike yesterday with my family, and I was just like, that is just wrong. That is, that is a sin, okay? So there are some things that are black and white, and there are gray areas. Men in yoga pants, that is not a gray area. That is, that is clearly a sin, and you should, you should clearly keep that between you and your wife in the, in the, in the marriage bed, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Good times. I'm glad we covered that. When it comes to the text that we're going to be reading today, we're going to be reading about gray areas. And, 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 um, and, and, and th this is going to seem somewhat silly because, well, look at that. Hey, you know, today... <laughs> We're going to be talking about, you know, food and that this big thing of, and you're going to laugh and we're going to read these scriptures where the Apostle Paul himself has to write letters to the church addressing what the, what the Christians are eating. Why? Because um, in the first century, food was causing radical division in the church. And guess what? In 2021, things that are just as silly as food are causing stupid divisions in the body of Christ. Why? Because you got people, they think that they are right and they lord their rightness over people at the cost of relationship and what Paul is going to say is that look there are things that that, that 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 just really don't matter but what matters is love love matters that community matters and so this is what we're going to be looking at um, uh, today. And also, just hoping that that graphic makes you so incredibly hungry that you'd maybe consider joining the church and coming to our newcomer luncheon at 1.30 p.m. Unless you didn't sign up, then you're going to need to not come. I'm just kidding. You can come. Just say Pastor Darren sent you. Here we go. Now, concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us 
possess knowledge. Knowledge is the Greek word gnosis. It means understanding based off of experience. How many, here's the thing about people that, that feel that they're right about everything. They've always, got the, they've always got the experience to justify their rightness, you know. And so it, it goes back to, you know, and, and now listen, I'm not making fun. I'm not mocking. I was about five minutes ago, but not right now. But all of us, we come from experiences, not at me. We come from experiences. We come from painful experiences. And how many know that when you were raised with a set and series of painful experiences, Experiences and you make a statement, an oath, a vow, and you are saying, I'm going to make sure that that never happens again. I'm going to make sure that my kids are not raised in that kind of household. We make these vows. We make these statements. We make these declarations. And a lot of times they're based off of fear. Because of the way we were raised, we are afraid that that event is going to repeat itself in our own life. And so what happens? Fear, it opens up the door to shame. What does shame do? It brings us to that point where we want to take control. Take control of people, places, things, um, circumstances. We want to control things so that the pain doesn't repeat itself because we don't want to go through the pain again. We don't want our children to go. So if you ever meet somebody that is super, super controlling, you say, man, why are they so controlling? Why, why do they want to control what I eat, what I wear, the way I comb my hair, right? <laughs> you know, why are you trying to control me? It always goes goes back, always goes back to a point in their life when they experienced pain, they made an oath, a statement that says, I will make sure that never happens again, and in this place of shame, I will control. It's what we call in uh, Restoring the Foundations ministry, the fear, shame, control cycle. And we see here, he says, some of you, you got the kind of knowledge, the kind of gnosis that comes from a painful, um, from a painful experience. I'll give you a couple other examples. You might have come from a household where your dad lost everything because of a gambling habit. And now any sort of Christian that pays, plays the lottery, they can't be a Christian because they play the lottery. Are you going to hell because you play the lottery? No. But Christians will condemn you and say you're going to hell because you play the lottery because of their own painful experiences in their past where a dear relative, maybe even their own father or mother that played the lottery, lost everything, made a judgment, and now they try to control everybody to keep them from playing the lottery, right? The same thing is true of, of alcohol. If you drink wine, are you going to hell? No. You know, Jesus drank wine. Jesus went to hell. He punched the, the head enemy, you know, in the gut. He came out of hell with the keys to sickness, hell, disease, and death. No. So we know that wine is not an issue, but double IPAs are an issue, right? And, and, and a good old single shot of whiskey is definitely going to send you, because where is that? In the Bible, right? Now, the same thing occurs when we go back to our background, right? If we had a parent that was an alcoholic, and we saw how that alcoholism affected them, and now we make a judgment and say, there is no way that you can can drink alcohol and be a Christian. We make big blanket judgments. Then we start denominations. We make people sign covenants saying that if they're going to be a minister, they can never have a drink of alcohol. And then all of a sudden you see pastor so-and-so on Facebook. He got tagged at a wedding. He's got a glass of champagne. And now we know that boy's damned because he had a glass of champagne. No, that is extra biblical uh, traditionalism and denominationalism. It is imposing something on the Bible that goes back to a triggering of the flesh that goes back to our childhood where because of our um, painful experiences, because of our shame, we develop control mechanisms that are extra biblical. It is a gnosis. It is knowledge that is based off of experience. <sighs> Paul says, now concerning food, all of us possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up, whereas love builds up. This is what he says. Listen, all of us in some sort of area have special insights. Blah, blah, blah. Do you have love? And then he says in verse 2, if anyone imagines that he knows something, isn't that funny? Paul. <laughs> if any of you imagines, using your imagination, thinking, man, I really know a lot, and yet he does not know as he ought to know, 
But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. This is what Paul says. The problem is that a lot of you know a lot of stuff. But you don't really know as you ought to know because you aren't properly known by God. Because you love what you know, but you don't really know God. This is what Paul says. The problem isn't what you know and what you don't know. The problem is that you're arrogant. You're proud. You're religious. You don't look like Jesus. And then he says in verse 4, Therefore, as to eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, this is what he says, you know, lions, tigers, bears, demons, principalities, idols. <laughs> Let's just laugh at that. There's only one thing you should fear, and that is the one God, the Lord most high God, Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh. There's only one thing you should fear, and that is the being, the I am, the self-existent one, the ancient of days, the one that is, that has been, that will forever be. That's the only God you need to fear. Isn't that funny? He says, as for these idols, let's just laugh at them. <laughs> as for demons, let's just laugh at them. <laughs> yeah. All right. Verse 6. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist. And the one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things, through whom we exist. This is what Paul says. And yet for us, we are from God through Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And all the saints of God say, Amen. I wish you guys would sing more in response to the sermons that I, <laughs> that I, that I preach. This, that, that's awesome. Hey, yet for us, Seattle Revival Center, we are from God. Look at the person next to you and say, you are from God. Through Jesus, by the Spirit. Verse 7, however, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do eat, and no better off if we do. This is what, What's food? It's fuel, right? And, and don't get me wrong, it can, also be, it can also be a drug just as dangerous and destructive as heroin. Food can be a, a blessing from God, a blessing to our body. It can also be a curse. But in regards to your spirituality, this is what Paul says, I love it. He says, food is just food. And you're no, you're no closer to God if you eat or if you don't eat. And you're no further away from God if you eat or if you don't eat. And then look at what he says, verse 9. But take care. Everyone say, but take care. Look at this. That this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block. Isn't this interesting? We're all Americans and, and, we, and, we, and we love our rights. In America, don't we just love our rights? I got rights. I got my rights. They, they, they try to take my guns, but I got my rights. Right? I got my rights. I'm a tail. <laughs> How many of you? <laughs> okay, obviously, I'm the only one having a good time right now. Like, yeah. <laughs> How many of you ever find yourself driving down the road and you hit that pothole that's been there for 20 years? You're like, I'm a taxpayer. Ah! You know, like, I got my got my right. It's... Okay. He says, um, but take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Yeah, hey, you got rights. You got freedoms. You got liberties in Christ. Amen. Hey, but let's make sure that these rights, these freedoms, these liberties, these yoga pants do not become a stumbling block to the weak. For verse 10, stay focused, guys. Verse 10, it says, for if anyone sees you have this knowledge in eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered 
uh, to idols. This, this is what he's saying. Hey, listen, you know, if you're, if you're eating a good ribeye and it was offered to the demon, ma, 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 you know, nerd, whatever, you know, it, like, hey, and, and enjoy the steak. But listen, if you're about to eat that ribeye and this dude just came out of a background of, of idolatry and spirituality where this thing uh, obviously had a real hook inside of this guy and now he's, now he's a believer and he sees you about to eat this meat that was offered to idols. There's the possibility that if you're uh, eating in arrogance and you are sporting your Christian liberty in front of this brother who just came out of this spirituality where this was a really big deal, where these guys actually thought that if they ate the meat that was offered to idols, that that would commend them closer to the spirit world or the spirit realm. And this is what Paul says. Hey, be careful that this right of yours does not cause a new believer or a believer with a weaker conscience to, to stumble. And what does that word uh, stumble mean? It means, to, um, it means to, to, to fall. And we know that Paul, you know, through his, 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 his writings in the Ephesians, that, 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 that the win for the believer is that having done all, that we continue to stand. That we continue to stand firm. Right, putting on the full armor of God, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, putting on um, the 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 belt uh, uh, around our loins of, of truth, um, putting on the the helmet of of salvation, right, with the sword of the spirit and the shield of faith, and shouting our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Why 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 would we we do all of all of that to make sure at the end of the day I'm still standing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That like for the believer. That's the win. That at the end of the day, no matter what hell threw your way, you're still standing. So if that is the win, then how dare we use our right or Christian liberty to be a part of a brother who is now no longer standing firm, but now a brother who's on the ground, which means that he is, he is vulnerable to be taken out by the enemy. Man, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that can come alongside of you to strengthen you by grace. I don't want to be the dude that is responsible for you down in the mud without your shoes of peace on trying to get back up as the enemy is coming and beating you down and giving you a walloping and this is this is what what Paul says he says hey um nothing wrong with a good ribeye that was offered to the to, to the whatever whatever but listen if, if if your bro just came out of that thing there's got to be a sensitivity there's got to be a care there's got to be a sense of compassion why because it's not about stinking being right that's the pharisaical that's the old thing yo christianity yeah wrong religion that what Christ stood for was not to hang 600-something laws over the people. <laughs> you know I'm mad when I start using the word yo. And that's because my, of my background in gangster rap. Verse 11, it says this. And um, <laughs> see, that's a stumbling block for me. You put on, you put on some Dre or something. The old, the old Darren comes. All right, this is what it says. And so, <laughs> by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Verse 12, thus, look it, guys, sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience um, when it is weak you're sinning against Christ. Wow. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Which, all right, now, that's going a little extreme. And just for the records, um, Paul didn't say that he's never going to eat meat again. This is just an example. This is, this, is, this is what he says. He says, listen, if me eating this meat could could cause my brother to stumble, I'm okay with just riding off meat. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be worth it. And, and this is the thing. So many times when we're having these conversations, is this a sin? Is that a sin? Will I get possessed if I do this? Will I get, you know, possessed? Like, you know, some of you, you know, uh, um, like when you're doing your workouts and, and you're engaging with yoga and you're, and you're listening to their things and they're, they're bringing your chakra points into, into focus and harnessing your inner chi and all that. Yeah, listen, you're, you're a Christian now. You probably shouldn't be doing that. 
You're trying to blend religions. You're doing these different things. Listen, you don't need that kind of peace. That's counterfeit peace. You got Jesus. That's, that's your true peace. You don't need a Zen den. You just need a prayer closet. You just need Jesus. But listen, if, if, if your idea of working out is just, you know, trying to stretch without farting, I don't think that that's going to pull a demon into you. It's how are, you, how are you approaching it. And listen, I know that people are going to be offended by it, especially um, on, on, on Pharisee book. But here's the deal. Like, when it comes to these things, there's a lot of gray areas. And it doesn't come back to the, to the pose, to the practice. It comes back to where is your heart? And are you opening yourself up to a realm? Are you opening yourself up to a counterfeit spirituality? Are you opening yourself up to idolatry through the eating of this meat? What are you opening up yourself to? Where is your heart? Is there unconfessed sin in your life? Is there unforgiveness in your life? Are you, are you involved uh, uh, in, uh, with an intimate relationship and you're crossing the boundaries and the lines of intimacy? Are, are you going to places on the internet where you know it's not right and you're allowing for your soul, which is the, the throne of your mind, your will, and your emotions to entangle with various things from fantasy to perversion to, to whatever else? Guess what? I got good news for you. Jesus loves you, but you shouldn't necessarily be doing that that is a violation against love and we know um, that when it comes down to it that religion's always looking for you give me the formula you tell me what to do you give me the practice that'll get me close to God and we love it and we buy those books three practices that'll get you close to God hey three five like five uh, doors that are going to open your family up to the demonic we love any sort of spiritual formulas but a lot of this stuff is Christian witchcraft because we're replacing we're replacing intimacy with formulas people would always love to go to a mathematical equation then to have to actually spend five minutes talking to God Pastor Darren, just tell me what to do. No. Why? <laughs> Should I marry the guy or not? No, I'm not telling you. Why? Because you'll sue me. <laughs> Can we just be honest? No, I'm not going to give you the answer. Why? I refuse to be your God. I refuse to be your Savior. I refuse to be your Jesus. I refuse to be your Holy Spirit. Should I be doing this? Should I not be doing this? Maybe he should be doing this. Maybe she shouldn't be doing this. The rules are different for you than the rules are for you. Why? Because it's not about the stinking rules. It's what does the Father have to say about this? Should I eat the meat? Should I not eat the meat? I don't know. Ask the Father. Ask your brother. Ask your neighbor if I'm engaging with this. Is, is it going to be okay? At the end of the day, will you still be standing firm? My brother, my homeboy, you got my back. I got your back. And in this place, we don't got to stink and pretend. We don't got to play religious games. We don't got to be like, like I, I got to be weird and act a certain way because this is the way that a Christian, look, can I say this word? Can, can I say hell if it's a location? Or can I say hell if it's a question? What the heck? What are the rules? What's the deal? This is the deal. It's not about that. It's about him. And it's about the person sitting next to you. And it's about the person sitting two rows behind you. And you have no idea who they are because, bro, this church has changed. Ever since, like, the COVID and all that. Like, this church has changed. I don't even know who anybody is anymore. It's about them. It's about them. And where are they at? And where, what are they coming out of? That we are all coming out of various Egypts and we are all stepping into new levels of intimacy and friendship with Jesus. And so, dear Seattle Revival Center, I am pleading with you because I am telling you, we have seen things swing. If, if you're a friend of mine on Instagram, then you know exactly where I'm going. If you're not, you should definitely follow me because we have a good time on there. But so I was born in 82, and so that makes me a millennial, just depending on what author you think is true. And so um, uh, uh, born in, in the church in the 80s, Assemblies of God, right? I was a third generation um, Assemblies. You know, my grandpa used to say, repent and be Baptist for all of sin and fallen short of the Assemblies of God. Um, and, anyway, so 
little pastor joke for you. So anyways, um, you know, raised in, in kind of this thing where there were a lot of rules and that holy, holiness was kind of defined by your, by your performance. And, and, and you would agree to a lot of different um, contracts and a lot of different deals. And if you go back far enough, you know, women couldn't wear pants. They had to wear dresses. They couldn't wear makeup. They, all the rules, by the way, were for the women, you know. Um, yeah, I'm just kidding. But, but there was, there was a, you know, you couldn't go to movies. You couldn't do, I still remember the first movie I ever saw in the theaters, Street Fighter. All right. Good times. And, you know, kind of born in this thing. And then all of a sudden, things started changing. All of a sudden, things turned. And I, I remember, my, my family and I, we went and saw an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie in the theater. And I was like, man, we are in revival, right? I was like, yes, things are, things are changing, right? And then all of a sudden, things started changing more and more and more. And then all of a sudden, you started hearing a lot of the, the, the horror stories in the church. And, and, and you started hearing about things going just way too far. And then all of a sudden, you, uh, Michael Brown uh, coins this term, hyper grace. And all of a sudden, you got this thing. Where I thought we were part of grace, but all of a sudden, it's going it's going too far because you hear about these guys that are you know smoking crack and then trying to do miracles and you're just like dude maybe things have gone too far like what is happening in the church and, and that is the story of the church the church swings like a pendulum and she swings hard you can go back to um, the Puritans that you know that would take a stand against Christmas and Easter since they were the inventions of the Catholics we want nothing to do with the Catholics amen All right it's like you've got that and you've, then you've got a, a revival a literal revival called the great awakening that is birthed out of a revelatory message that god is owed you are in his hands and it's only by a sliver of grace that you are not being sucked into the bowels of hell right now it was sinners in the hands of an angry god and it gives birth to a revival that captures the heart and reforms an entire nation you swing all the way into just about five to seven years ago and you find yourself in a soaking atmosphere sitting on abba papa daddy's lap stroking his beard having revelations of riding roller coasters with Jesus and you're just like my gosh this thing feels bipolar like one second God is furious and the next second he's all the papa daddy and he just wants like who's right who's wrong and what does the future look like for the church listen if history <laughs> continues to repeat itself then you guys right now in the present that pendulum it's swinging back and honey we about to go back to the 80s and I can already hear and discern that frequency on Facebook there are the, the, the fed up preachers that enough is enough and we're about to take this country back and we're these backslidden preachers and churches and, like, and, and you know and we're going to get back to this place where we think that, that porno altar calls are going to bring forth this new revolution of holiness. I'm sorry I've been there, I've done that and I still know that the kindness of God leads men to repentance. Listen, I don't care what you've done. I deserved a good hard spanking more than any of you. And what I found were kisses from an adoring father. And yes, I believe, behold, the goodness and the severity of God. And yet I am not going to go back to handbook Christianity where a certain set of rules and practices define my holiness. No, I will fight that the supremacy and authority of Christ Jesus remains central to the grace message of the church in America. And this is what I I mean it, that you will not perform your way into a closer relationship with Jesus and when you stand before God it will not be because you threw away your yoga DVDs if you stand before the Lord it will not be because you burned your ACDC album this is what I know we will pray we will obey we will seek first Christ Jesus and his kingdom knowing that all these other things will be added unto us if you're in sin there's grace if you're not in sin you need just as much grace and if your brother is in sin you need to have grace with your brother Paul would say this well are you saying that that if there's grace I could remain in sin and defiant rebellion before the Lord and Paul would say you're damned if you do because you have no revelation of grace. This is what I know. That whenever Holy Spirit speaks to me and gives me a revelation of my sinfulness and I repent, that's my upgrade. And I go up a notch. I go up to the next level. Therefore, when I get to repent, I consider it an opportunity. I give glory. I give Why? Because the best things that ever happened to me happen just after I repent. Rebellion and pride, it'll be the end of you. But humility and repentance... 
It'll mean that you're changing and growing and going from glory to glory. But a religious spirit, it will bind you to a set of series and structures in Christian witchcraft, and it will cost you your intimacy, connection, and authority to Jesus. And you'll always go back to, how do I heal the sick? Oh, here are the, here are the three E's to heal the sick. No, there's one J to heal the sick, and it's Jesus. So it's okay to ask your sister, hey, would it offend you if I did this right now? You can ask your brother, hey, would it offend you if I did this? You can ask your sister, hey, what is your background? What, what is your Egypt? What is your testimony? What is your story? What's your conviction on this? What's your stance on that? Why? What are you doing? You're building intimacy. You're building friendship and you're defining the boundaries for that relationship because you cannot do Christianity outside of relationship you'll just end up a bitter old sterile Pharisee and you might have all your functions and you might have everything in order according to the outside but on the inside you'll be sad lonely and frustrated look at I pulled all of that out of food no don't clap don't clap don't clap but that like that just shows you what 11 years of pastoring will. <laughs> I'm just kidding I'm preaching a message on humility right you're like how cool am I right now I fall off the stage break my nose it's 12 years by the way 12 years Speaking of 12, Mark 12, 28. And one of the scribes came up to him. And when one of the scribes came up to him, Chris White also came up to the stage. And when one of the scribes came up to him and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he had answered them well. Check it out, guys. Which commandment is the most important of all? Verse 29. And Jesus answered, here's the most important commandment. Are you ready? Remember, in this time, it was all about the commandments. In this time, it was all about the rules. Like your spirituality was dictated by your, the rules and your ability to follow them. So this Pharisee, he asked a great question. Like, listen, I want to be, I want to be legit spiritually. So like, what's the most important of all the rules? And this is what Jesus says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Okay, so this is what Jesus says. Hey, if you, it, like, the, here's the most important commandment, okay? The most important one is you just fall in love with Jesus. Lord, I love you. I just thank you for who you are. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. God, I woke up this morning. I needed, I needed your mercies this morning. Lord I, Lord, I know that you got daily bread for me. Lord, I, I thank you that you're going to protect me today. I thank you that you're going to protect my family today. Father, I thank you that you have, you have, you have good plans for my children. I pray that I'd be a, a good parent, that I'd be a good father for my children today. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you so much for the most incredible gift that you've given to me beside my salvation. That's my incredible and beautiful, my holy wife, Andrea. Father, I pray that you bless her today. Lord, I pray that the dreams and her desires of her heart would be satisfied, Lord, in your presence, God. Father, I thank you for Seattle Revival Center. Thank you. This is the most incredible church on the earth. Thank you that you surround me by some of the most gifted and anointed leaders, Lord. Father, I pray that you bless them today. Father, I pray that you'd wrap your, your big fatherly wings around our community. Father, I pray that you'd protect us from pestilence. You'd protect us from disease, Lord. I pray that you'd protect us from discouragement. Father, you are one. I pray, Lord, that we would be one just as you're one. Father, I pray that our community would be known, Father, uh, by, by love. Lord, I love you. I thank you for your presence. God, I need you. I need you more today than I've ever needed you before. Lord, I just pray that you'd show up today. Lord, I just pray that you'd show up in my car today. I pray that you'd show up in my office today. I pray that you'd show up in meetings today. I pray that our conversation Lord, I pray, Lord, that the dialogue, Lord, I pray even when I get angry, that I'd be angry today and sin not. Lord, I pray that I'd be angry today, but not sin against love. Father, I pray, Lord, that I would ins inspire others to be righteous and to be holy um, through their identity in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray that I'd be real today. I pray that I'd be honest today. I pray that I wouldn't have to censor myself today because you're doing something good and holy within me, Father. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for our community. I thank you for our city. Lord, I thank you for our nation. I thank you for the
for the leaders that are in place, Lord. Father, I pray that you'd bless them today. God, I ask for wisdom and favor. Wisdom and favor. Wisdom and favor. Wisdom and favor. But above all else, Father, I pray that you'd grant me wisdom. And then he says, and the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. And that means that in the same way that I can connect with God, I can connect with Grant. I can connect with Corey. I can connect with Anthony. I can connect with David and Moonjo. I can connect with Elon and Christine. I can connect um, uh, uh, with Ricky. I can, I can connect that my heart is open. Father, I can connect with you and I can connect with people. And that when I'm offended, I'm not going to disappear. When I'm offended, I'm not going to send a text message. When I'm offended, I'm not going to send an email. When I'm offended, I'm going to show up. I'm going to set up. I'm going to set up a meeting. We're going we're gonna to talk it out. This sucks. You hurt me you made me feel this way um, uh, this is how I feel this is how, what I think happened but I'm going to show up I'm going to show up because relationship matters and you matter and I know that if I sin against you it's a sin against Christ it's not about what's right it's not about uh, that it's about relationship and it's about guarding the integrity of these relationships that we had let's stand together Father I pray Lord that we'd be a community that's in love with the community of heaven that the Father the Son and the Spirit would be so present within our lives, Lord, that we would be modern day mystics, that we would be walking in the frequency and the glory of heaven, that we would be glory walkers, walking in spirit and truth and excellence and distinctiveness. Hey, that there would be a contrasting anointing, Lord, that this body of people, that they would heal the sick, that they, they would raise the dead, they would cast out demons, they would know what their Bible says, they would know their God, and yet they wouldn't be jerks they wouldn't be arrogant Lord that they would still be humble and teachable and friendly and cool and that when 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 everybody is getting triggered they'd have the grace to be able to chill out a little bit and to collect their thoughts a little bit father I thank you Lord for this community Lord I thank you for this this Sadek community I thank you father for this Melchizedek community I thank you father for this community of, of kings and priests and God I pray at the end of the day that food would not die divide us that food would not divide us because your glorious Holy Spirit has forever united us and God in the same way that you are one we pray let us be one for your glory in Jesus name everyone said I, 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 awesome, awesome, awesome. Pastor Anthony, get up here, close this thing out, bud. Come on, was that good? So good. If our uh, ministry team and uh, leaders could come on up, we want to pray for you guys. Um, we want to bless you guys and just see God even further touch our hearts. I know he's doing an awesome thing right now. Um, so feel free to come on up if you need some prayer. And uh, if you haven't signed up for the welcome lunch and you want to come, go get a coffee. Come on back at 1.30. Join us. We'd love to have you. You guys, God bless you. Have a great Sunday. And we see you next week, 228. All right, take care. Welcome to Seattle Revival Center. We've got some great things happening here at SRC starting today with our welcome lunch. So if you are new to SRC and would like to take that first step to get plugged in here at our church and community, we just encourage you uh, to join us at our luncheon. That's just going to be following today's second service at 1.30 downstairs in the fellowship hall. We are launching our brand new 6 p.m. service on February 28th. So mark your calendars. Be sure to come to this new evening service. And also, we are launching 6 p.m. service teams. 
So if you want to be a part of that, we just encourage you to scan the barcode that's right on your, actually it's not a barcode, it's a QR code, and that's gonna be right on your morning's bulletin. And that'll give you just an overview of some of the teams as well as an application form. But yeah, we're so looking forward to our third evening service and are excited to see you there. And if you wanna get plugged in even further here at SRC, uh, we have Activation School that begins on February 28th. Uh, so this is a six week course on Sunday morning Mornings, taught by our pastors and leaders here in this house and we'll really get you acquainted with the culture here at SRC. Uh, so spots are filling up. We just encourage you to register for that as soon as you can. Our connect groups are in full swing. If you haven't had a chance yet, please look at our online catalog on our website. Find a group that's right for you. Get plugged into community and yeah, sign up just as soon as you can. And as always, we just encourage you guys all to check out our website for more events, happenings. There's a lot of other stuff that's going to be rolling out here at SRC. So stay tuned on our website.